Oh, thank you. It's very nice to be uh, back here in town hall again. Uh, the list of books that you read were told about, actually it goes back to my first book was when I was nine years old. <laughs> Never published. Uh, I'm going to talk about my latest book, which just came out this month. Uh, but, it, but it goes back, uh, my thinking that led to this book goes back at least to when I was a teenager. Uh, you know, some ideas percolate slowly. But when I was a, a 19 years old at the University of Michigan, uh, I took a history course. I was an econ major, and I took a history course about the Great Depression. And I thought, you know, there's a lot here that I'm learning from this historian <clears throat> that I'm not getting in the econ department. So when I was a uh, half century later, when I was elected president of the American Economic Association, I thought I should tell them about, about the importance of history. It turns out that economic history has been in decline uh, in universities for many years. Uh, and it, that's sort of what I want to bring back, but not just that. It's, a broader, it's broader than just history. It's about stories that, that people tell, not just our stories, but other people's stories. So uh, I'm going to talk first about what I mean by narratives and stories and what it, role it should play in thinking about the economy. I'm going to try to be very uh, universal in my sources of information, including medical epidemiology. Well, I'm talking about stories that go viral. That, that if you think about that, that's a reference to what goes on in the medical school, isn't it? They study epidemics viral or bacterial, either one. Uh, then the theme that I'm going to develop is that narratives are like diseases. Uh, uh, they, they spread by contagion, and they change our thinking. And they go through a path that uh, would be familiar to epidemiologists. This isn't entirely new. You may have heard talk about, like Richard Dawkins talked about this in his book, The Selfish Gene. He is a biologist, that ideas are like viruses. But it hasn't been applied systematically to economics, and it seems like we're missing something. Economists, in the absence of knowledge about what people are thinking, assume that they're all rational, and that I, I can hypothesize what they think, and that their concentration of attention is on tangible things like interest rates or tax rates, uh, and, but it seems to me it, it's good to do that, but it's, it's kind of limited in that people have, they change their thinking en masse, millions of people from time, from time to time, and those bring on economic events. So, uh, uh, the, the, and then I'm going to find it with just a, briefly, I think that we're, going through a, we will go through a revolution in economics with improved data sets now that we can search. You're probably searching all the time now, right? Uh, it's a new world where we can f search what other people are saying and thinking over the world and, and back into history. So I'll illustrate that, but not complete the research agenda. So this is my book, uh, which just came out. Uh, the cover... Uh, can you see that red dot? Yeah. Th that shows an epidemic curve. Uh, it says how stories go viral and drive major economic events. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about some important events like the Great Depression or the Great Recession that we've just been through 10 years ago. But the, the key idea, th uh, there's already a change in economics. They're more interested now in behavioral economics, which is economics and psychology together. There's been a revolution that I've been involved in uh, for decades. But what I'm defining here is it might be considered part of behavioral economics, but to me it's different because it looks not at enduring patterns of human behavior, but it looks at changes in the way we think, and it looks at narratives. Now we'd like to know how people think about the economy, but there isn't much study of that. 
One reason is that uh, people are, find it difficult to explain what they're thinking about the economy. Uh, so you can't just ask someone, why didn't you buy a car this year? And someone will say, I don't know, why didn't I get around to it? I didn't get around to it this year. But you can, I think if, with more study of what people actually want to say, you can learn about what their, how their thinking changes. So I'm reminded of a, a criminologist who went to a prison and tried to ask prisoners about their philosophy of life uh, and got very little reaction from them. But then he discovered that he could get, uh, uh, learn about their philosophy of life by doing this. He points to some prisoner over there. What's he in for? And they all know, they all know each other's stories. And they'll tell a long story about this other prisoner. And you know what? There's moralizing in it. It's not like criminals have no morals. They, 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 they do, and they have an idea of what's right and what's wrong. It might be a little different from ours. So that's the kind of inference that I want to make about the economy and how the economy changes through time. So the term narrative economics, uh, so I, I did entitled my presidential address before the American Economic Association two years ago on uh, narrative economics. But the term goes back over a hundred years. But it meant something different. It used to mean economic, uh, economics in the form of economists' narratives about what went on. It was just economic history. I want to emphasize that uh, narratives occur in constellations that uh, it's not just one story, it's this, a number of different stories that are repeated. So the best example that I think of right now is uh, Donald J. Trump. So when was the last time you thought about him? <laughs> How recent was that? <laughs> well, I, I assume there are both supporters and detractors in this audience. <laughs> um, maybe I attract the detractors, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let's not start that, okay. Uh, but, but isn't it kind of curious how everybody is focusing attention on this one person? And there's so many stories. It's, it's partly because they're contagious. People love to hear Trump's story, I think. Whether they like them or not, they love it because it's so bizarre or they're so uh, interesting. There's also a confluence of narratives. The problem in understanding any big economic event is that there's millions of narratives, and some of them gain traction and go viral at the same time, even if they're unrelated, and that can make for a bad uh, outcome. But the problem is that the story of the outcome is complicated because you have to have lists of narratives to explain what happened. So I'm talking about uh, narratives in economic. I have to say I'm not an original thinker about narratives. Uh, the thought that narratives matter and that they go viral goes back well over a hundred years. Uh, uh, Gustave Le Bon in his 1890s book, The Crowd, it was a popular book then, talked about idea microbes. <laughs> they hadn't discovered viruses yet, so he couldn't call them uh, going viral, but he had the same ideas. It's obvious, if some people say, that, that, that ideas spread like stories, in the form of a story. Uh, but uh, econ economists are not uh, that impressed by this. So I did, uh, using a digitized database called JSTOR, I did a search for the term narrative in anthropology, economics, finance, history, political science, psychology, and sociology. The black line is from the beginning, going back sometimes over 100 years that these journals have been out. And you can see that finance is the field that has the least attention to narratives. Economics is the second. They love narratives in the history department and in the anthropology department. So I think we have to just learn from these other, other departments, and that's my uh, message to economists. The gray bars show what's happened in the last 10 years. That's the percent of articles with the word narrative in it in that field. And you can see in every single field, 
attention to narratives has gone up. I think that's partly due to the advent of digitized text, and you can now quantify somewhat uh, narratives. So my attention to all these other fields uh, is an example of consilience. That man, you may not recognize him, uh, is William Hewell, who was a philosopher of science at Cambridge University, uh, and he, he coined the term consilience. It was picked up by the biologist E.O. Wilson in a book he wrote with that name as his title. And uh, he was speaking about the unity of knowledge among the differing academic disciplines, especially between the sciences and the humanities. Yeah, I, I think that we tend to compartmentalize our thinking too much. There's a scientific way of thinking and a literary way of thinking. But to understand economics, you have to understand both. We're talking about real people who might decide, I don't want to buy a new car this year, and they can't tell you why. Maybe you psychoanalyze this person and find out that there's fear of, uh, of something, you know, that, that made them hold back. So, now here is an example of an epidemic curve uh, uh, from uh, a, a real disease. I, this plot comes from the Center for Disease Control and it's tabulating an epidemic, or an outbreak of Ebola in uh, Lofa County, Liberia in 2014. Th these, these epidemics seem to go in patterns of, they'll break out in a certain place and, and go through an epidemic pattern and then go away and then come out somewhere else. It's mysterious, but epidemiology tries to study it. So uh, in 2014, in June of 2014, suddenly, about a dozen cases of Ebola appeared in this county. And then the next week, another, what, looks like about 18 more appeared. Then we had a little respite, but it was choppy, but it was growing for uh, 10 weeks. And then it turned around and went off. Now, why did that happen? The epidemiology, the simplest model is that something picked the contagion rate up in week one, Maybe the, uh, there was a change in weather or a change in patterns of uh, co communication or p getting together. Nobody knows what it was. It's, all, it's so subtle. It's something about the disease was spreading. Maybe they were sharing food. I don't know what they, why they were doing that then. But uh, Eventually, the epidemic t tapers off after the contagion rate falls below the recovery rate. And then you still get new diseases, new cases, but fewer and fewer. And then it just disappears. Or it's as much a small a level that it's no longer concerning. Here's an example of some narrative epidemics. Uh, I've got a, a whole, from the years from 1850 to 2019 shown. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, Bitcoin. Have you heard of this? <laughs> Is there anyone who hasn't heard of Bitcoin? I don't see any hands up. This is a disease with 100% penetration. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's kind of mysterious because the, uh, the Bitcoin relies on uh, digital signatures uh, that, were, uh, that were amazing discoveries or how to do uh, uh, a code with a uh, public key and a private key. This was developed by um, uh, three authors in the 1950s, I think. It was called the RSA algorithm. I'd like to see how many newspaper articles were written about the RSA algorithm ever. 12. Okay, how many were written about Bitcoin? It was more like 12,000. So why is it so much different? Uh, well, I think the RSA algorithm, there isn't much to say about it except to get out the chalk and write down some equations. <laughs> it appeals to tech uh, people, maybe, a little bit. But Bitcoin has a better story. And I'm arguing that uh, that story is, uh, accounts for its success. That's how I was able to attain a value of over $300 billion because of the quality of this story. So what was the story? The story was, is that Satoshi Nakamoto invented bitcoins 
uh, and uh, they, they were programmed up and began about a year after that. But nobody has ever met Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> this is strange. How could he invent something? And not only did he not take credit for it and show up in any public domain, but nobody ever saw him. How can that be? Well, he was emailing, apparently emailing people who then decided to follow his idea. And then he went silent and disappeared. So nobody knows. Maybe he's one of the billionaires on this planet. Isn't that a nice story? It, doesn't ha it just has to be a story that you would repeat. There are other elements of the Bitcoin story that resemble other epidemics in the past, notably its representation of anarchism. So anarchism is a belief that we need no government at all. If you just got rid of government, people would live in peace and harmony and it would be a great world. Uh, now that is kind of a dumb idea. Uh, it, comes, it comes to our minds when we're filling out income tax forms. Uh, <laughs> And at other times when someone orders you to do something, and you bristle at that. So for a few minutes, you don't believe in government. But the problem is we've been calling these people stupid for close to 200 years. And so they, they just love it when they hear an example of something that the government can't control and looks like it's working out really well. That's Bitcoin. Supposedly, the government can't control it, although we turn out they're taxing it now. So I guess they do control it somewhat. I'm going to compare it with another uh, thing called bimetallism. You heard of that? Any, has anyone heard of it? I got one or two hands. Three. And nobody else. Oh, four, OK. Uh, but I don't see any enthusiasm for it at the <laughs> moment. So bimetallism was a, a, a theory that there should be this was when the gold standard was the, the standard. Money, a dollar was defined in gold. They wanted to switch it to gold and silver, so it's two metals. And they wanted the exchange rate between the two such that it would actually cause massive inflation, then wipe out the real value of debts. So it was considered a little bit anarchism-like, and it was crazy. The, uh, in the East Coast, I don't, know about the, I don't know about Washington, but back in the 1890s, it was sort of an Eastern intellectual phenomenon. Uh, maybe uh, you won't be able to tell me what, what Washington State's reaction was. <laughs> but, and they were calling these uh, uh, Midwesterner farmers who liked Bitcoin, like bimetallism, calling them stupid. And they resented that and they were angry. Everyone was talking about bimetallism. It was splitting the country. Uh, a reporter from the East who went out to the Midwest to uh, see found that people talked about nothing else. Uh, so that's it, kind of like Bitcoin. Maybe it's even bigger than Bitcoin. It looks like it's a little bit bigger. But it went through this epidemic curve and then died out. I, I think any story about money, if it's well told, is kind of cool. People like those stories. In the uh, 1930s, we see a little blip for uh, bimetallism. They also talked about electronic money that would be tied to electricity, <laughs> believe it or not. This is a crazy idea, but it was popular. They wanted to change from the dollar to the watt, and you'd pay someone so many watts. It never happened. But this is why Bitcoin, by, by, I'm saying them, this is why bimetallism was so popular. It became popularized. So this book by uh, William Hope Harvey called Coins Financial School was published in 1894. And it looked almost like a comic book. It's a story of a boy whose name is Coin, very a fictional boy, who is lecturing to a group of prominent financiers and professors, stodgy, <laughs> look, they look sort of Eastern, okay? The intellectuals. And he's, he's lecturing on bimetallism. And these guys ask questions. I don't know why they're listening to this boy, but that's the story. And uh, he, they ask him questions that are kind of snide and you're ignorant. But he always comes back with a brilliant answer and puts them to shame. So this was, there was this tension between different parts of the country. Uh, this book was a huge bestseller and it, it dominated the 1896 election. So this is an epidemic curve. 
uh, shows, I, I'm not going to get into the mathematics, but this was uh, the Kermack McKendrick model published in uh, 1927. Uh, and I'm, uh, it, but it, it's, it has two parameters, a, a contagion parameter and a recovery parameter. This is for a disease. Uh, and this shows the number of infectives. Now the critical thing about an epidemic curve, I have it starting out with uh, one invective in a million. So it's like we have a, a city with a million people in it and there's one sick person comes to it. Uh, the contagion rate is now, let's assume the contagion rate is uh, corrected for number of susceptibles is greater than the recovery rate. So the disease is already expanding in the first weeks, but it's, uh, you can't even see it yet because it's so small. It, it, it takes, in this case, 23 weeks to get noticeable, and then it just explodes. It's, it's been exploding all along like that, but you can't see it because the amount is so low and then it falls off. So this kind of curve appears again and again in studies of diseases, but it can appear also in studies of uh, narratives. The question for economists is, are they causal? Do these cause anything? Or are they just nonsense that we can ignore? I'm referring here, you, you, we can't do controlled experiments in economics, uh, not, on a, not macroeconomics. So, um, uh, you can, however, do laboratory experiments outside of economics in the fields of marketing, journalism, education, health interventions, philanthropy, and law. There have been literally controlled experiments that show that ideas spread further if they're in the form of a narrative which is vivid, has human interest, has visual imagery, uh, uh, that involves the listener in sort of an identity uh, thought, that th this somehow represents who I am and why I'm an important, my life story seems similar to this story. All of those things contribute to the contagion of a story. So, uh, so uh, there's, there's, I could go through a number of examples here, but you know that uh, newspaper people are taught, when you write a newspaper article, you must have noticed this, you don't start the article out talking about statistics. You start the article out about John and Mary Smith who had this experience. And you go through several paragraphs about the family and the experience. Then you turn to the thing about there's an epidemic of this going on and you quote some statistics. You can't catch their attention unless there's a story. These people will spread the story uh, in their conversations if it's vivid enough, but only then. I also talked about, already talked about constellations of, uh, constellations uh, in uh, epidemiology are called co-epidemics. So for example, uh, tuberculosis and HIV are co-epidemic. When one appears, the other appears, or it tends to reinforce each other. Uh, but uh, we can talk about narratives in the same way. So uh, here are some examples of, uh, epidemics among economists. Uh, these are famous economic models, the ISLM model, the real business cycle model, the overlapping generations model, and the multiplier accelerator model. Uh, they all, they're all hump shaped. So these data are from 1940 until uh, 2008. You can see every one of these epidemics, it's kind of jagged like it is with disease, but every one of them went through a hump shape pattern. So for example, uh, Paul Samuelson published the multiplier accelerator model in 1939, that's just before the start. And it did nothing that you can see until sometime in the 1950s, and then it exploded into a big epidemic as measured by counts in, news, in books here uh, using Google engrams. And then it faded away, just like they all do. This, this is kind of depressing for me as an economist, you think, I could come up with some brilliant theory and I'd be good for 10, 20 years if I'm lucky, and then it will fade away. Life is like that. Um, so here, here's, an, uh, here's an example of, uh, of an epidemic um, uh, narrative that I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, the story uh, was in a book written by Jude Winiski in 1978. And the story uh, went like this. 
at, uh, Art Laffer, an economist, uh, was having dinner with Dick Cheney, future Vice President of the United States, and Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, really important guys, and Jude Winiski was there. And uh, Laffer pulled out a napkin to show, to draw a diagram uh, illustrating a basic point why cutting taxes can sometimes raise revenue. So what he said, let's talk about the tax revenue that the government receives for various tax rates on income. If the tax rate is zero, of course they'll raise zero revenue. If the tax rate is 100%, well, they're not gonna raise any revenue either because nobody will work if the government's gonna take it all away. So the relation between tax revenue and tax rates has to be hump-shaped, right? It goes like that and then back. That, that's hump-shaped on its side. The lesson, is, and this is the punchline of the narrative, the lesson is, if you want to raise a thousand, or winning any number except the, at the peak, uh, there's always two tax rates that will achieve it. That's surprising. I never, feel I never thought of that. This is the Democratic tax rate, and this is the Republican one. <laughs> they were all Republicans, so they liked this story. But it turns out that this story went viral only after Jude Wanisky published it, four years later. Uh, Art Laffer said he couldn't even remember the dinner. He could hardly remember it when it came out. But it became memorable, and it spread over the whole world, especially English-language-speaking countries. Uh, and uh, you wonder, what, what, what is the relevance of the napkin? It, it's typically told that he wrote it on a napkin. Isn't that irrelevant? I mean, uh, he, why are we interested in this diagram? Isn't that awfully nerdly or <laughs> technical? But somehow the story worked, and Jude Winiski knew that. He was a skilled writer and knew that this could be a viral story. And it, it's, it, it's the whole thing that we remember from his book. Many years later, in fact, fairly recently, the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. Uh, decided to put together an exhibit on business history. And somebody there said, you know, we ought to get that napkin. <laughs> and so they tried, on a, just on a chance, they, they called, uh, Winiski had died uh, since then, it was a long time ago, and they, they got his widow, and she said, he says, can you look among his things and see if you can find a napkin with a drawing on it? So she went and looked and she found a cloth napkin with exactly this diagram on it. So they were triumphant at the museum and they put it on their exhibit. You can find it if you search for Laffer and Napkin in National Museum of American History. Uh, but why is, uh, th there was a little problem with that. They later talked, uh, a reporter called Art Laffer and asked him about it. And Laffer said, I don't believe it. <laughs> what do you mean? This is a story about you. It made you famous. He said, well, I don't believe that I would ever write on a cloth napkin. <laughs> My mother ta taught me not to dis deface nice things. But see, that's the story. The story has a certain tension to it. And it helped uh, promote Margaret Thatcher to prime minister, a tax-cutting prime minister in the UK, and Ronald Reagan, a tax-cutter in the US. I'm not saying it was the only, it was part of a confluence of narratives. Uh, this is the uh, accounts in uh, both um, books and news and newspapers of the Laffer curve. And nobody ever said Laffer curve until Jude Winiski's book came out, and whoa, did it go up. And then it started falling off until around 2000, a new epidemic started, and we're at a new peak. Well, I don't know if it's a peak, it's going up. This justifies tax cuttings, and it justifies running a deficit and seeing it get to really high levels. This is a, 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 an engram's a search of books for names of, of famous economists. Uh, and. Uh, you can see that there's this guy, Henry George. You ever heard of him? He was really big. You should read his book. <laughs> his, he wrote one book, Progress and Poverty. And it's a, it, the title comes from uh, the, the fact that machines were replacing jobs. That's progress. Why is it, he said, that at this time of immense technological progress, we have poverty that's 
uh, growing. That could be the theme today, but it's not written right for today's audiences, so it's, it's fading away. But they're all hump-shaped, including Art Laffer, there he is. He suddenly appeared with that narrative. The narrative is bigger than he is. Uh, uh, that's what uh, happens. So what I did in my book is to uh, talk about a number of actual narrative constellations. Uh, and th but they, uh, the theme is that they reappear in history at intervals, just as influenza does. Influenza, well, it's seasonal for the first thing because of the effect of the weather on contagion, but it also goes through occasional big epidemics uh, be uh, because of mutations in the virus. By the way, get your flu shot, okay? Uh, this might be a bad year because there was a somewhat worse year in Australia and it's coming this way. This is the time to get it. Uh, all right, that's my lecture on it, health. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk, cover all these, I don't have time, but uh, panic versus confidence, frugality versus conspicuous consumption, the gold standard versus bimetallism, labor-saving machines replaced many jobs, and then it became automation and artificial intelligence, are having a, will have a catastrophic effect on jobs. That's the narrative. Real estate booms and busts, stock market bubbles, boycotts, profiteers, and evil business. And finally, the wage price spiral and evil labor unions. So I'm just gonna stop for, give a few of these and then uh, open this to questions. Here's a constellation of narratives. The panic of 1837, the panic of 1857, the panic of 1873, the Panic of 1893, and the Panic of 1907. Those were all bank runs. So here's what happened in each of those cases. Somebody, you're, you're talking with someone, and he or she says, did you hear about the Eagle Bank? They're running out of money. There's a crowd out there today de uh, demanding their money back from the bank. So you, take, you hurriedly go over to the Eagle Bank because you've got your life savings in there. And there's a crowd outside. Oh my God, so you manage to get your money out. But then you go around spreading the, the, the word and it just grows until the Eagle Bank can't, they don't have all that money on hand, so they fail. That, uh, in, during the, that happened in 1837, but they didn't call it the Panic of 1837. They didn't start calling it that until after the Panic of 1857. And then you can see the Panic of 1837 is the black line. It just grows and grows with all of the other panics uh, until around 1907. That was the big one. Remember the Panic of 1907? Anyone here remember the Knickerbocker Bank? <laughs> I don't think so. It's just not in our repertory of live narratives. So we're not gonna say this is 1907 all over again because it's just not something that people remember. This is a business, con well, so panic, I think people were getting psychologically sophisticated somewhat in the 19th century. So they attributed panic as an emotion to economic events. It peaked somewhere in here and then it went off. The idea of consumer confidence and business confidence came later. The uh, Great Depression is itself a narrative, the 1929 crash and the subsequent years. Uh, but in the, during the Great Depression, they hard, not many people called it the Great Depression. There was a 1934 book by Lionel Robbins called The Great Depression, written in the middle of it. Uh, I used to think that that was uh, the beginning of this term. Well, maybe it was, but it wasn't talked about a whole lot. The Great Depression, in both books and news and newspapers, grew over the decades. Uh, and it, it got quite popular. This is like 0.1% of articles in news. It's one article in a thousand. That's a big number for this kind of thing. So it means everybody was reading about the Great Depression until uh, 2008. And look what happened. It went up like fivefold in one year. What was that event? It was the failure of the Lehman Bank and uh, other. Uh, oh, it's Washington. We're in Washington. I hadn't realized. I've been citing WAMU, that's known over the whole world. It's not just Washington anymore. Well, it, it was becoming a powerful bank and it, it failed. It had to be rescued. Uh, so, uh, 
I think it was the narrative. And we even named this recession the Great Recession. That's naming it after the Great Depression. So we were reliving it because we, th we think about it a lot. Uh, frugality versus conspicuous consumption. There's two parallel neighbor there, narratives, they're opposite. A frugality narrative dates back to ancient times that it's just not good to show off your wealth. So they had sumptuary laws uh, in ancient Rome, ancient Greece, and ancient China. So these long history of narratives about that. The conspicuous consumption narratives are narratives that you better show off. That's the way you, successful people establish themselves. People won't respect you unless you show off. The, the, the prime exponent of that recently is Donald J. Trump. Who, uh, he wrote a book called How to Get Rich. Uh, and, and in that book, he uh, tells you, don't be shy, don't worry about being boastful. He says that, I'm not quoting him word for word. Don't, don't afraid, because people will, they'll get the lesson that you're an important person if you boast. If you don't say it, they'll never figure it out. So uh, he's encouraged, the, the, the problem is that these narratives correlate with economic events. So for example, the frugality narrative, I'm quoting here, Winifred Holtby, who was a columnist for the Manchester Guardian in 1931, it's now called The Guardian, it's a good newspaper. She said, dare to be poor. In other words, can we not use this period to get rid of a little snobbery and bunkum and li live lives dictated by our own taste instead of our neighbor's supposed notions of what is done? With so much to do in a world so rich in experience, must we shut up ourselves up into little genteel compartments? That was a Great Depression attitude. And a number of observers said they heard this a lot. Um, you know, maybe we were all phony in the 1920s, uh, that we were all show-offs. And let's get back to be real people. It brings up the thought that maybe the Great Depression was a better time to be alive than the 1920s. <laughs> the Roaring Twenties. There were people saying that, you know, people just seem nicer nowadays. Um, they also had the concept of involuntary unemployment. Uh, in, uh, the, the word unemployment didn't exist until the 1890s. There was a depression of the 1890s. Uh, and uh, it started to grow uh, after, you can hardly see it in 1890s, but it's, uh, the idea of involuntary unemployment is something that could happen to anybody. It's because of the economy. Uh, and uh, it grew in, on like an epidemic curve. Uh, this cuts off in 2008. Uh, it went up again, I'll, I'll show you. But there was, I, I searched more diligently and I found there was a term called involuntary idleness, which is sort of a synonym to involuntary unemployment back to 1800. But they, used to, they didn't have the word unemployment. They only had the word idleness. And I think that sounds a little bit less uh, faultless, right? If someone is idle, are, are they really, un, is it really their uh, accident or is it their own fault because they're lazy? Well, in the Great Depression, people completely got out of this thing that failures are lazy. And you can be a failure for reasons that have no reflection on your character at all. So there were lots of beggars and lots of people giving money to beggars in the Great Depression. It was a whole change in atmosphere. This is um, oh, involuntary unemployment. You can see how it spiked during the Great Depression. So you, you, didn't, you could dare to be poor. And that's one reason why people were poor. They, they were cutting back on their expenditures. James Truslow Adams in 1931 uh, wrote a book called The Epic of America. And in that, he coined the term American Dream. It's actually an interesting book. Nobody reads it anymore, I don't think. Has anyone read it? I don't, yeah, I, I didn't think so. Uh, the idea, uh, well, in his own words, it is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of a social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. I, I note he says each man and each woman, which was very unusual back then. Uh, so, uh, especially male authors, I suppose. Uh, but the, the key idea here is evolved through time. 
That's how the term great uh, American dream grew through books and newspapers after he published it in 1931. It just grew and grew. And I think it changed a little bit in meaning. But it, uh, it, the American dream, I'll, I'll restate it in very blunt terms. It's okay to buy that big showy house and that fancy car because, well, people, they won't be so re resentful. This is America and you'll be an inspiration to them. So that good-for-nothing nephew of yours, he will see that you, uh, you've succeeded, so he'll think, I can do it too. So just go ahead and show off. I don't know if that's awfully vulnerable. <laughs> Maybe I'm exaggerating what the American dream means. But there is some core idea that there shouldn't be shame in wealth, which is uniquely American, or it was uniquely American, and it's spreading around. It's visible in China and other places now. Uh, another, uh, this will be my last narrative, and I'll open it up to questions. But um, I mentioned labor-saving machinery. Uh, that it starts out uh, in 1811 uh, with the, the Luddites, and uh, who were weavers whose jobs were displaced by mechanical looms. They were hand weavers, uh, and they they stormed the factory and destroyed the machines. And it was reported all over the world. But it didn't take off. The term labor-saving machinery just grew and grew over the whole 19th century uh, and peaked around the early 20th century. And then the new term was invented, technological unemployment, which exploded into prominence in the Great Depression. So people in the Great Depression largely thought that the, there, there were two theories that dominated. One was the, the only thing to fear is fear itself. Uh, by, uh, by President Roosevelt. And the other one is the technological un unemployment. So they would point out that uh, robots are everywhere. Like, for example, that dial telephone you have. Telephones, until around that time, didn't have a dial or a keypad. You would pick up the receiver and you'd, an operator, you'd be connected, to, you're always connected to the operator. And the operator would say, number please, and you would speak the number to the operator, and she on a switchboard would connect you. When, when we got an automatic connector, that's a robot. And it was a scandal. When they installed dial telephones in the US Senate, uh, a number of senators revolted and said, we're displacing jobs with this. So tear them out, and we'll go back to the old phones. Um, so we don't have very many uh, operators like that anymore. There's still some. But uh, but they thought that this was a big turning point right now in 1930 or 31, that the world has reached the limit of jobs and now there won't be any more. Uh, and why did they think then? I don't know. Some, some narratives uh, developed. There were some inventions that were like the dial telephone. Even smart people believe this theory. <laughs> this is Albert Einstein in 1933, the very depth of the depression interviewed by the Boston Globe. According to my conviction, this is Einstein speaking, it cannot be doubted that the severe economic depression is to be traced for the most part to internal economic causes. The improvement in the apparatus of production through technical invention and organization has decreased the need for human labor and thereby caused the elimination of a part of labor from the economic circuit. So that's Einstein. I think uh, Einstein wasn't exactly right. I, I, I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to criticize Einstein, but uh, he was right about it, that something like that was tied in with the Depression, but he was wrong that we reached a turning point in history where there wouldn't be jobs anymore. That day may come, but it keeps taking longer than we ever thought to get here. Uh, and right now we have a 3.5% unemployment rate. Oh, I'll talk, I, I, I add this too, since I'm in Seattle. Uh, home prices. Uh, uh, this is a plot I had from the second edition of my book, Irrational Exuberance, that shows home prices from 1890 to the present. Well, it was, when my book came out, it was there. And I was predicting that there would be a financial crisis in 2005 because I said something doesn't look right here with the, the level of home prices. Uh, it's not explained by building costs, population, or interest rate. Nothing else was happening to describe, to, to, to explain this huge boom in homes that eventually collapsed to the Great Recession. And now we're back up. 
Well, we're not, all, these are real home prices corrected for inflation. If you didn't correct for inflation, they'd be at a, a record now, nationwide. This is for the whole nation. This is for West Coast cities, and I have Seattle in red, okay? Uh, this, this is only for a shorter, you know, these are the, I, I developed these indices that are now published by CoreLogic and uh, S&P, Standard and Poor's. Uh, according to our home price index, uh, these are the, the home prices uh, at, uh, normalized to, uh, a thousand, to 100 in the year 2000, from 18, 1987 to the present. And uh, the, all these cities seem to have similar movements. They, they all went bananas in the years just prior to the Great Recession. And they all go down catastrophically, losing, you know, uh, more than half of their uh, value, their real value uh, in, in a matter of a few years. And then they turn around and they start going up again. We, we were really noticing Seattle uh, out east because it, uh, it, it was the strongest city of our 20 cities that we study uh, just for the last couple of years. Uh, but now it's uh, actually down from its peak a little bit. I was trying to figure out why that is, and I, I don't live in Seattle, so maybe you could tell me. Uh, I thought, could it be something to do with the 737 MAX? Uh, some loss of, no. And then I thought, well, actually, it, it looks like it, it was tracking Portland, and they're all going up at about the same rate, all of these cities. It just hung on a little bit longer than the others. It's, there's a slowdown going on now. So why is it? Why would it change right now? Why did it change? Why was there this big change here after zooming up and then suddenly, in a matter of a few years, they start collapsing? Well, I think it's epidemics uh, of ideas. And I'll just show some evidence of that. Uh, these are from Google Trends. You can look at what people are searching on Google. So uh, this is, I, I searched Google Trends for the search housing bubble. And you can see that in 2003, there was a huge peak in 2003-2004 in uh, searches for the term housing bubble. Before that, not much. I think it was a new word uh, at the, that was coined at that time. That people didn't talk about housing bubbles. Not so much. I mean, you might have seen it occasionally. It didn't go epidemic. It didn't go viral. And then it started to be talked about a lot in newspapers at the time of the financial crisis. But there, it, this thing happened. It was a change in consciousness around, uh, I'm sorry, this is actually 2005. I'm just reading. Did I say 2003? I was reading it wrong. 2005 was the sudden emergence of the word housing bubble in articles questioning that we may really be in one. But home prices were still going up in 2005. If I can show you evidence, this is from The Economist magazine. Uh, and it shows a, this is June 16th, 2005, and it shows a brick falling. It says house prices. But house prices in the U.S. were still going up. They wrote in this issue, the, the editors of The Economist, perhaps the best evidence that America's house prices have reached dangerous levels is the fact that house buying mania has been plastered on the front of virtually every American newspaper and magazine over the past month. It was a story about mania. It's a new word. It didn't say panic. It was mania, another psychological term. This is Time magazine. Just a few days uh, after that, uh, Economist, home sweet home, why we're going gaga over real estate. Th they don't say it's going to crash, but they say we're going gaga. This happens somewhat suddenly. Also, talk came in about flipping houses. Look at that. This is from 18... Well, obviously, they didn't invent the term. They didn't have the term flipping houses until around 1980, when it was typically condos, not houses. Uh, but then they, uh, flipping a house means reselling it quickly. Uh, and uh, these are Google Trends searches for the term flipping houses. You can see it was growing from around 2000, this is around 2005, to six, seven, eight. There was a tremendous sudden interest in flipping houses. But this was after the boom was over. Uh, it was used typically pejoratively about crazy people who think they can make a fortune flipping houses. And then flipping houses disappeared for several years. 
And now it's back, but not with the same intensity. So, you know, we're not back in exactly in 2005 again. We might be a little bit like that. And I'm just going to say, repeat what I, this is my last section. I think that uh, we, uh, uh, the new technology of search and digitized text is going to change economics. And we, we can help it along by collecting better digitized data. Uh, we don't really get conversations directly. We have to rely on newspapers and magazines that report on them. Uh, and so I think that, but even if we don't do that, there's going to be a change in our, we, economics today has been for decades past, mainly a study of the Federal Reserve and the Department of Treasury and uh, uh, the statistics that are already been, that, that were started to be collected during the Great Depression on a, a GDP and unemployment and stock price indices. We went through a whole era of that kind of quantification and it, we lost the human element and I think it will come back in economic research in the, it, but it will take decades to achieve. So I think I'll stop and we have a little time. For yeah, so thank you so much for that talk. It was very interesting. <laughs> thank you. So we're just gonna transition into Q&A and I have two reminders. Um, please speak into the microphone because we're recording this event. There's one here and then there's one on the opposite side. Um, and then please keep your questions in the form of a question um, so that we can get through as many as possible. We'll do it for about 15 minutes and then Professor Schiller will be signing in the North Lobby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. <clears throat> as mathematics is the language of science and nature, economics in substantial measure appears to be the language of influence, politics, and power. Uh, in this light, Dr. David Sloan Wilson wrote in regard to the fragility of truth. If you want a vision of hell on earth, you can't do much better than a world where no facts can be trusted. On the other hand, science also teaches that evolution ruthlessly selects against truth strategies and for survival and reproductive payoff strategies. Do you have any thoughts on what economics and history teaches us in regard to this dilemma? Uh, that's a very deep and broad question. I refer you to William Hewell and other philosophers of science. But uh, I think that you're right that uh, sometimes untruthful, fake news uh, becomes more viral. And if it's concocted to be viral, uh, it can be hard to squelch fake news even with the truth. Uh, so you have to have a, you call it a truth strategy. Uh, but uh, that means forming a counter narrative. You can't, uh, you can't just state the facts, it won't be interesting. This has been known for uh, millennia. Uh, I recommend a book, or it's not, it's an essay you can find on the web by Lucian of Samosata, written in the second century. And he, d he gives, it's cynical advice about oratory. And he tells you, don't worry about the truth. He's pretending to be an or a or a rhetoric or oratory speak uh, teacher. Don't worry about the, the truth. Uh, the, the most important thing is be shameless. When, some, when somebody points out that you were wrong, never admit it. Just change the subject or start something new. Uh, it sounds familiar from what I've seen lately. Uh, so maybe you're next. So the narrative now is that the stock market is wildly overvalued and you actively lose money putting your money in a bank account or bonds, which are sinking down to the sea. What advice can you give real people about <laughs> where they should put their money? Uh, I, I will answer that indirectly. I think you, uh, real people should get real financial advisors. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, I was talking to one financial advisor the other day who told me that one of his clients, when he came in, had all of his money in cannabis stocks. And, uh, and this person, if, if I heard the story right, was nearing retirement. Don't do that, I can tell you. 
Uh, so the important thing, this sounds very lame. I, oh, by the way, you can take my course. I have a free course on Coursera called Financial Markets. So one of the things I talk ab about is uh, efficient markets. That uh, It's a half-truth that markets are efficient. It's not 100% true. But if you're not going to seriously uh, endeavor to uh, study and work hard to find investments, uh, maybe you just live your normal life and diversify, and hold a wide, and get your financial advisor to help you do that. Okay, we'll go over here next. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it seems like one of the big allures of narrative economics is that we can predict what humans are going to do in mass and potentially benefit from that in, in many ways. But at any given time, if we were to do a search right now, we'd probably find thousands of possible narratives right. out there. So how do we go about figuring out which narratives of the many we could find online are likely to grow and actually change human behavior and what that behavior is going to look like? Well, I, I and some of my colleagues are working at that. I have a new paper uh, with a couple of uh, colleagues on uh, the news and uh, the stock market. So I've been collecting data for 30 years now of both individual and institutional investors on the probability that they give to a stock market crash like 1929. And we're looking at news events that we can quantify that might shake them and make them give higher probabilities. And we find that uh, one example of a news event that raises the probability of a stock market crash in the minds of investors is an earthquake. We have data on the zip codes of the uh, uh, respondents, uh, and we have uh, their probabilities, and we can look for which zip codes had an, had an earthquake. And we find there's some correlation. Uh, but it's not, as, uh, not a big effect. Most stock market crashes, well, there was the Kobe earthquake in Japan in the 1990s that was followed by big corrections in stock markets all around the world. And I can't prove, maybe it's hard to prove these things, but I think that uh, this, the Japanese stock market crashed days after the Kobe earthquake, uh, and they did in other parts of the world. And I looked at news uh, reporting on Kobe, and it kind of showed Japanese incompetence in dealing with a major urban earthquake. And so maybe that left people on edge all the way over to the U.S. and Brazil. Now, I can't prove it. But now, the, the fact is, economists, they never prove anything. I mean, it's like they're mo they have models, and they, they judge them on probability. They have implications, and you'll find that the implications are sometimes partly borne out. Uh, and uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a problem that has plagued social sciences from the beginning. So Alfred Marshall, who was a great Cambridge University economist in the 1890s said, and he had the famous textbook, Principles of Political Economy. Uh, he said, economics is not an exact science. It's not like physics. Uh, e economists suffer from physics envy. They like, they like physics. They wish they could be physicists, at many of them. I was in that stage at one point in my life too. Um, but it's just not physics. So we can, we, we can ignore, I think these are revealing of truths. Uh, and if you criticize, it would be possible to criticize these narratives that I've defined and say that they're not important. But it looks a little bit like a historian arguing. Uh, and so uh, I, I just think that's all right. That's the best we can do. I also recommend going into economics. It's a good field if you're interested. And there are lots of jobs for economists. So maybe I'll go over here. I have a two-part question. So the first part is, um, so who do the physicists envy? I'm sorry? So who do the physicists envy? Like, if economists envy physicists. Um, I'm sorry, who does the physics envy? I'm sorry. Not... <laughs> like, who do physis physicists envy? Like, in terms of, like, what's, it's fine. Well, you know, they, they, envy, <laughs> they envy Albert Einstein. He is <laughs> far and away above, head and shoulders above, uh, of other, uh, other physicists. There's just nobody that compares. And why do they admire Einstein? I think it's partly because of his wild hair. Uh, and he, he also uh, plays the violin, so he's a cultured man, not like other physicists. 
Uh, it's, just, it's just a good story. Yeah, I guess lots to admire there. Okay, sorry. So my real question is, um, I feel like the things that you're talking about is already somewhat an application, especially when you see influencers on social media who are actively tracking their viral outreach as they use their own personal stories to sell goods and services to their followers, the people who are ripe for infection. So my question is, do you see the possibility of this research getting to data that's hyper-specific to, to get to more of that causal relationship? For example, we can like tie Twitter content and Twitter networks to like where people are going, we can track their geodata so we can see if their content relates to more visits to shopping centers over time and, and actually be able to see how it influences consumer behavior. Yeah, I didn't mention the social media, but they are very important communications that are actually observable. Uh, and it's been used, for example, to uh, identify influenza in epidemics quickly by just looking for searches for influenza. When you're getting sick, you'll start searching for influ influenza, wondering whether you have it. Uh, so I think that the world is gonna be changed. Uh, and for a young person like you, that means it's gonna be really different when you're my age. Uh, the, just imagine, if, uh, given what artificial intelligence is today, what's it gonna be like when you're my age? Do you worry about that? I'm kind of on the fence about all the self-knowledge and targeting because, okay, hot take here. It could just be a, a more efficient way to getting to the things that you already want, or it could be, you know, this ongoing echo chamber of, you know, just becoming more within a particular network or community. So, on the fence, I guess. We'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes, yeah. Thanks. Uh-huh. So. Thank you. Um, so you've shown many hump-shaped curves in your presentation. Um, I was wondering, are there any salient features or fingerprints we can see in the increasing portion of some of these curves to make predictions about the corresponding rate of decline? Well, there is an epidemiology literature on forecasting of epidemics. Uh, and they do trace on epidemic. So uh, I'm not uh, an expert on that, but I think we can learn from them. The curve has a, it has a flexion point. It goes up and then it is concave upward, and then it becomes concrete downward. So I, I'm, I'm thinking like an epidemiologist when I think Seattle home prices might be headed for a decline. But that isn't really a forecast. That was just a concern. Because uh, Seattle had been going up the fastest, uh, in, a couple of years ago, the fastest of our 20 main cities. Uh, and now it's slowing down. And in our latest 12 months, it was declining. Uh, so I, I'm tempted to forecast further declines uh, because that seems to be a, a pattern uh, revealed by epidemiology. But I, I, I think I should maintain humility because there's a lot of work to do to master the forecasting literature and e epidemiology and then adapt it to economics. Uh, economics can change suddenly, though, because people think uh, it's not just purely mechanical. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm curious if your study included uh, narrative economics around the growing income disparity or trends in income disparity and whether um, the way that it's reported in the news and the mass media is accurate in terms of the forces that are driving um, income disparity and you know a lot of it tends to be a blame game about who you know which actors are causing greater income disparity and I'd be curious to get your take on that. That is, the rising income inequality within nations is a huge issue and it's driving uh, politics around the world including uh, at, uh, moving toward populism because populism tends to appeal to people who have lost in the uh, it doesn't appeal so much to the billionaires. Uh, so that is, a, uh, that is a, a real concern right now. I don't know what more I can say. That you, yeah. And it is a narrative that is uh, e exam examples. But it's not so powerful. There, there aren't so many unemployed displacement by machines right now when we have a, such a strong economy. I think the narrative will be reborn the next time we have a recession, uh, which could be in, the, in next year or, or several years. 
and then we'll see how big it gets because there will be new inventions uh, of artificial intelligence replacing jobs. Just the other day, there was an invention of uh, a machine that can control a hand that can solve Rubik's Cube. Did you see that? It's a mechanical hand that actually does it. Amazing. And if something else comes up in a year or two, it could spark another uh, outbreak of the, of the uh, artificial intelligence scary narrative. Yeah. Yes. With respect to planned obsolescence, um, what are your thoughts on, on economists, David Graeber, and works like Bullshit Jobs? I'm sorry, who, what economist? Economist David Graeber and his book, Bullshit Jobs. I have not read it. Can you tell me what it's about? I can guess from the title. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably us professors, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is about academics and no, uh, experts. Bull bullshit Jobs is about sort of like a, a social feudalism that means that a lot of jobs are kind of unnecessary, but they occur anyway because we have large structures that fund our corporate economy over our entrepreneurial economy. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know what to say about that general topic. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur. I founded a company. I'm, I'd be thankful to Yale University that they let me do it. I, I did it one day a week for a while. The, the Case Schiller Weiss company that produced home price indices that I just showed you. We sold it in 2002. It was an episode in my life. It was rewarding. I wonder why there aren't more professors who do that, uh, given that uh, universities allow them to, thinking that they want them to stay connected to the real world and not become too academic. Um, so maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the narrative I got from my father, who was a entrepreneur, a failed entrepreneur, but he tried it. Uh, so, yeah, I feel that we've, we do get too, I don't know about what you mean by the title of that book exactly, but we do get too wrapped up in our local culture uh, and uh, not uh, be adventuresome enough. This is a lesson, uh, uh, I'm not a Trump supporter, but I, did, I learned some things from him. It's a lesson for Don, from Donald J. Trump in his book that uh, risk-taking is f painfully difficult and most people don't even want it. It's too much stress. Uh, I think I, uh, I, 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 I have some of that in me. I, we, well, we all have a little bit of Donald Trump in us, <laughs> maybe very little. I don't want to be coming across as a Donald Trump supporter. I, I, was, <laughs> I was on CNBC and I got all kinds of hate mail all of a sudden. I, I hadn't uh, explained myself properly for being a Okay. <laughs> Hi. So one of my favorite books is an talks about how economics is an engine, not a camera. That is, unlike physicists who study the physical world but aren't going to be able to affect it, what economists say right. and what they write actually really affects the economy. So what do you think about that, particularly in the context of narrative economics in your most recent book? Well, I, I didn't exactly uh, say that in the book. But I, I can remember uh, when I was an undergraduate, I took a course from Kenneth Boulding at the University of Michigan. And uh, after, he, after I graduated and left, uh, he was, became president of the American Economic Association. And he wrote his presidential address. The title was Economics as a Moral Science. I think I was influenced by my undergraduate professors more than anything else. I don't know why. I, so he said exactly what you did, is that economists are not just studying the world, they're changing it. And so it's not a, uh, it's not a fixed, you ask someone to forecast the next recession, well if you can forecast it, then you'll change the pattern of the recession. So we have to be thinking about what kind of world we like. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that we should be worldly philosophers. Uh, so I guess I've been in agreement with your point, but I just, I've, I've heard this a long time ago. Some of these tensions will persist. There will still be a tension within economics between more humanitarian and historical-based economics and mathematical economics. And both of them make useful contributions. Hey, um, 
I saw, it seemed like most of your data sources were kind of like words and newspapers and articles and then Google searches as they were more recent. I'm curious if there's other data sources that are like, you think up and coming that will really change the field or really, is there kind of one new data source that, or, or a data source that's not even plausible that you think would just be your dream data source to get more information about narrative economics? Well, as for data sources, uh, they're constantly coming up uh, in terms of digitized text. One of them that I had took a little time to explore was church sermons. Uh, and I found there are databases for church sermons uh, uh, because they're moralizing, right? They, 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 it's done on a Sunday or a Saturday for the Jewish. Uh, it's it's uh, a time for reflection. And so you get somebody's reflection. But I found there are databases with church sermons, but they're not, uh, what I found so far doesn't have a historical basis. They tend to be great sermons as inspiration for ministers who are writing sermons. Uh, I don't want the great sermons. I want the small town sermon. <laughs> I want to know what people were saying statistically. The other thing is personal diaries. There are already digitized uh, texts of personal diaries. Uh, but, but not, uh, by the way, when you're writing in your diary, uh, stand forewarned, it might be digitized someday and be searched <laughs> by somebody. Uh, so I, I started reading diaries of deceased people. It's okay after they're dead, right, to read their diaries? <laughs> but I found it was too distracting. I got stuck on a diary of a 17-year-old girl from the 1930s. I thought, look, this is wasting my time. Uh, that's the other problem with the internet. You can get distracted by too many, too many things. Uh, and, and then I think there will be changes in the search algorithms that, uh, uh, that they're getting better and better. So it, right now, I'm, you know, I, I start thinking about uh, uh, doing, for example, I, I wanted to search for the term meme, which is another name for a thought virus, but that's Richard Dawkins' invention. I start searching for that, and then you know what? Even though I'm searching in English, it comes up as the French word mem, which is quoted often enough that it just messes up my results. So we have to have some better, more intelligent search engines that really recognize ideas. Oh, the austerity myth is a myth that a government uh, that uh, takes in uh, more than it spends uh, is uh, an inspiration. And it will, uh, instead of deficit spending, is that what you refer? Yeah. Uh, there are still opponents of Keynesian policy, which would be deficit spending in a time of recession. Uh, and I, I can refer you to articles about that. I don't know if it's, uh, they're very convincing. Uh, I, have to I have to do some more reading and think about that. I, I'm still thinking that Keynes, John Maynard Keynes was right about deficit spending. And that's what s saved us from a worse uh, recession in the Great Recession. It could have been the Great Depression. We were primed for it in terms of our narratives and our, uh, and our, uh, Fears. People in 2009, the stock market was already down around 50%, and they were thinking it's going down a lot further, and a lot of them were pulling out of the market. Of course, that was totally wrong. We're now at new record highs. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we will be doing a signing in the North Lobby, so anybody that wants to get his book signed can meet him there, and there's also a bookseller down there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going out here. I guess.